This is Computers as Components, Chapter 2, Architecture and Assembly Language. One of the basic concepts in computer architecture is the von Neumann machine, in which we have a memory that holds both data and instructions. So the central processing unit, or CPU, fetches instructions from memory and then executes those instructions. It's this separation between the CPU that performs the work and the memory that tells the CPU what sequence of operations to do that distinguishes a programmable computer from other types of machines. Now, so CPUs have uh, several types of registers to help out. Program counter, as we'll see, or PC, that holds the location and memory for the current instruction. The instruction register, or IR, that holds a copy of the current instruction. Um, ha may have some general purpose registers, some special purpose registers. So here's an example. We have the memory on the left side, the CPU on the right side. Okay. Um, the memory and CPU are connected by what's called a bus that allows the CPU to send an address to memory to tell the memory what location to access and then the memory can either send data back to the CPU for read or the CPU can send data to be written to the memory. So in this case our program counter has a value of 200. So we want to use the contents of location 200 as the next instruction. So now the CPU sends that on the address bus to the memory and the memory sends back the contents and the CPU puts those contents in the instruction register. So now the instruction register has this instruction um, inside the CPU. So now the CPU can work on it. A variation on this is the Harvard architecture in which the CPU uh, is connected to two different memories, one for data memory and one for program. Each of them has address and data buses. So in the Harvard machine, uh, because uh, the program and data are separate, we can't do what's called self-modifying code. That is, a, Harvard, uh, a von Neumann machine can write to a location any kind of data at once and then set the program counter to that location, read that data back in, and execute it. Uh, in a Harvard architecture, um, the data and program are separate. Uh, but the Harvard architecture allows two simultaneous fetches, one to the instruction memory, one to the program memory. This is uh, allows both greater memory bandwidth and also more predictable bandwidth. There's not as much interference between the two. And so Harvard architectures are often used in digital signal processors or DSPs. You'll also hear the terms RISC and CISC. CISC stands for Complex Instruction Set Computer, which has many different addressing modes or ways to calculate the address uh, to use uh, in, the in the current instruction, and has many different types of operands. A RISC machine, or Reduced Instruction Set Computer, is uh, designed as what's called a load store architecture. That is, the only instructions that can directly access memory are the load and the store. Uh, operations like add, for example, can't operate directly on memory. RISC machines allow us to build um, more easily high-performance uh, high pipelineable machines. Let's look at the characteristics of instruction sets a little bit. How long is an instruction? In some machines, all instructions are the same length. In some other machines, like the Intel architecture, uh, the length of an instruction can vary quite a bit. Addressing modes, that is, how do we uh, calculate uh, an address? Having several different addressing modes can help us write compact, efficient code. The number of operands uh, that an instruction can operate on at once is very important. The types of operands, character, bit, uh, different types of integers, different types of floating point, other, other types of operands. And the, the concept of a programming model is very important 
for um, our purposes. Um, a CPU may have many different registers that help the CPU do its job, but programmers can't directly use those or even see them. The programming model is the set of registers that are directly usable by the programmer. And that's what we'll be working on when we write code. Some registers in the machine are not visible, and the instruction register is a prime example of that. In most architectures, you cannot uh, directly see the, the instruction register, even though it's there. Now, um, a given architecture is the set of instructions um, that uh, the machine operates on and we want to be able to build several different implementations of the same architecture to run at different clock speeds, different butts widths, different cache sizes and so forth. That gives us some choice in the cost performance trade-offs of the CPU without having to rewrite our code all the time. Now um, the instructions in memory are sequences of bits, which is a little too low level. So we often abstract that out a little bit as assembly language, which is a textual form of instructions. Um, generally speaking, assembly language is one-to-one -one with instructions. That is, one line of assembly language corresponds to one instruction. There are a few e exceptions to that. Um, we use labels in an instruction to um, give a name to a location. Um, if a uh, line does not have uh, a label on it, then the instruction usually starts after label one. The address, the label, is identified as a label by starting in column one. So here's an example. The first line has a label that starts at column one, and then the um, instruction itself, this is called the opcode, starts later. And then we have other uh, uh, um, statements um, that don't start at line one, so these do not have labels. Not every line has to have a label. These two lines have comments. The comment starts at the um, semicolon and goes to the end of the line. We don't need to put anything at the other end of the comment because it runs to the end of the line. Now, the, the exceptions to the one instruction, uh, uh, one line of assembly language, is, are usually called pseudo-ops. These are things that help us um, control the assembly process. For instance, defining uh, the current address, reserving storage, defining constants, things like that. Now, another concept in addition to uh, RISC and CISC that uh, you may run into is a very long instruction word, or VLIW. These machines can perform several instructions simultaneously. Okay? You may have also heard the term superscalar, which is also a type of machine that can execute several instructions at once. The difference is that in the VLIW machine, the programmer or the compiler determines which set of instructions can run together. In superscalar code, the machine determines that at runtime. So you may hear the term packet for VLIW machines, which is a set of instructions to be executed in parallel. How do we know it can be executed in parallel? Well, we can look at, uh, for example, data dependencies. So here we have two plus operations. The result of this plus operation feeds to the next, next plus operation. We can't execute these two pluses at the same time because we need to know this result before we can do the second add. Okay. So in contrast, these different adds can all be done at the same time because the uh, results of one are not used in another. VLIW is in fact used a lot in embedded computing systems, particularly high-performance embedded computing systems. Uh, it, it allows high-performance parallel computing, but it's more energy efficient than superscalar. And VLIW is particularly useful in signal processing applications, either multimedia or processing multiple channels of signal, signals, for instance, in wireless systems.